Hey guys, Crypto Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about this, which is a star tracker, not a mount, not a go-to mount, just a star tracker on which you can put your DSLR or a small telescope, like really small telescope, and then get good tracking accuracy of the stars. There's no go-to, there's no like automated plate solving and slewing and centering of objects. It's a manual star tracker, old school. And what is very special about this star tracker is it's open source and mostly 3D printed. So what's the deal with this uh, star tracker and how does it compare to like offerings from Skywatcher, for example, like the Star Adventure 2i, which is kind of like the, the go-to star tracker for a lot of people. Well, let me go a bit into the detail. So this star tracker was built by a guy called Andrej, or Andr on. Andre, Andre, I'll call him Andre, sorry about that. Uh, Andre, and uh, he basically was looking at the Star Trekkers available in the market. He decided that there was no Star Trekker that fit his needs perfectly, that had like the proper tracking accuracy to support like long lenses and, and large exposure times. So he decided to build his own. <laughs> And so here we are. Now he makes it available both as an open source hardware in that you can go uh, and print all of the parts yourself and then combine them with parts that you can buy at a hardware store to make your own version of this exact same tracker. Or you can buy the kit and assemble it yourself. It just comes with all of the parts 3D printed already and all of the screws and all of the, the bearings and the motor and everything like that. And then you just need to assemble it. You can also buy it fully assembled uh, as well. And the cost of this uh, non-assembled, I believe the kit together with a pointing laser for polar alignment is around 175 euro. So it's basically like half the price of the Star Adventure 2i. So yeah, that's where I come from. I'm like, wait, it's open source hardware. Anyone can make their own if they buy stuff at the hardware stuff, uh, store and 3D print the parts. And also it can hold apparently up to three kilograms and it apparently can take uh, 60 seconds long exposures reliably at 300 millimeters focal length, which is something that's really hard to achieve on a, on a star tracker. Apparently this one has a fairly long period and the periodic error is only 17 arc seconds peak to peak, which isn't the, like the smallest periodic error I've, uh, I've heard about in star trackers. There are some Japanese star trackers that boast far better accuracy, but they're also like 10 times more expensive. So it's not the same category anymore, but it is still better than a lot of other star trackers on the market while being cheaper. Well, okay, so how good what is it? <laughs> so first, let me get into the details. I received this star tracker for free from Andrej directly. He contacted me. Uh, I, I didn't get paid, but I received it uh, in the non-assembled model. It's like kind of like partly assembled, like the, the motor cage was assembled. The rest I had to do myself using some clear instructions and in videos that he made public. But as far as I understand, I do get to keep the star, star Trekker at the end. So please be aware of that. Now, with that in mind, let me talk a bit about the assembly process of the Star Tracker. Overall, because the, the motor cage here was already all built, it was fairly painless, although I had some difficulties assembling, in particular, like the, the belt at the, at the top here. There's a belt that goes from the motor to the, uh, the, the part that will rotate and hold the telescope or the camera, uh, I had trouble like putting it there because it needed to so much tension or me to pull so hard on it in order to put it on. Uh, but once that was done, that was probably the hardest part of the whole thing. And it's quite smart in terms of the tracker. It has basically a built-in, it is in and of itself, a built-in wedge effectively, where you have like this uh, screw that is available here to adjust the altitude of your polar alignment. And you have these two screws at the front that uh, will manage the azimuth of your polar alignment. And you want this direction to be pointed towards the uh, celestial pole. And it also has here a very tiny uh, belt tensioner, which is good because then you can really change the tension of that belt towards like that big, rotating part in the middle and it has tons of bearings i had to install like several bearings in there so it seems like really well built uh, that said there are there were like some frustration about like putting the belt on that was really annoying to me and also there are some things that come together with like the 3d printed uh, territory like uh, uh the uh i i i can have like uh, this little uh 
piece there just like go off of where it's supposed to be and then I can pull it back together. So it's like there's small details there that, you know, have a little uh, nice aroma of, of jank. <laughs> but that's not a bad thing per, per se, it's just something to be aware of. I will also say that a part of the Star Tracker was actually broken upon arrival. I fixed it with epoxy, but when I told Andrej about it, he told me that he would normally just like send a new part, but I told him like, yeah, no, no, no. I just want to test it out as it is with the broken part and all. Now, in terms of the assembly process, if you want to see me do the whole assembly, I have a completely uncut version of the whole assembly. That uncut version uh, contains some strong language as I kind of swear to myself while I'm having trouble with the belt, for instance. But if you're interested, I'll put the link uh, up above. It's an unlisted video, so you can only access it via that link. I'll also have a link in the description. But again, there is some strong language in the video and something like one hour long. Uh, so it's just if you want the full experience of seeing how it is assembled and exactly, you know, how, how the parts look like, then that is the way to go. So as I assembled it, I will say my biggest disappointment, and this is something that Andrej has already told me he would fix very quickly because it's an easy fix, but it's the fact that the screw here at the top, which will hold uh, a, a, a camera bolt head, like a tripod uh, head to hold your camera. And also the hole at the bottom of the Star Tracker, I currently have an adapter on top of it. This, this silver thing doesn't uh, come with the Star Tracker, but they're both one quarter of an inch adapters. And uh, I did not have any tripod or any bolt head that supported uh, one quarter of an inch. I only had like three eighths of an inch uh, uh, tripods and ball heads. So I'm like, I need to buy adapters. So I bought an adapter for uh, here and I bought an adapter for here, but you can see it's less than ideal. I I'd really want to just be able to screw it in directly without having a an adapter here in the middle. The adapter does introduce a bit of wobbliness on this tripod that I'm using it. This tripod, by the way, is the Seastar S50 tri uh, star tripod. Oh, and another issue that I, that I found really annoying as well is that the bottom uh, three, uh, one quarter of an inch uh, hole for the uh, tripod side, the depth of it was simply not enough. I was not able to fully thread in my adapter and I don't think it would have been able to, even if it had been three eighths of an inch, I don't think it would have been able to thread in uh, the, the whole screw of the tripod. Obviously that's a recipe for wobbliness. So I hope that Andrej can probably make like this base part Slash slightly thicker, uh, maybe like three millimeters thicker, so we have more depth available to us when we screw in the uh, the tracker. I'm sure Andrej will leave a comment in this video, and if he does, like you know, check it out. He might put some updates on his website. I'll have all of the links, of course, to the tracker if you want to purchase it down below in the description. But I'm pretty sure that all of those issues will be fixed very soon. Another issue that I had is, you see, there is a laser pointer holder right here, uh, but I'm not using it. And this is simply because the laser that I got uh, was a, a laser that's basically illegal in Japan. So I immediately broke it and threw it away. Um, I didn't realize <laughs> it would come with a laser like that. Uh, green lasers, they're typically too powerful in Japan to be uh, owned and used legally. I also don't want to take, I'm not sure about the, the laws here concerning pointing uh, a laser at the sky. And I didn't want to risk it because there are, I'm not so far from Haneda airport. I'm uh, fairly close to some American and Japanese air force bases. So there is a lot of um, traffic in the air all the time. Uh, and I really don't want to be pointing a laser by mistake at an aircraft. So I did without that completely. Now, what do I like about this device? Well, it is a surprisingly well-built device. When you think of 3D printed, you like robustness doesn't come to mind. This is robust. It's like it will not move and it will not break. The belt tensioner is also really well done, although I couldn't find any mention of it in the documentation. Uh, Andrej has a, a typical like en engineer syndrome, I feel, in that he's so smart that he forgets that people like me are dumb. <laughs> So yeah, this, this little thing here is a small screw that lets you tension the, uh, the belt there, which is a really nice addition. And that should be documented. And another thing that I really like is that the tracker piece and the base piece of the tracker, they form a wedge in and of themselves. You do not need a separate wedge. Uh, all of the star trackers that I've used up to now from the uh, Vixen Polarier uh, to the um, 
uh, Star Adventurer 2i to the one of the Ioptron uh, Star Trackers, I don't remember the name, uh, they had like effectively a separate wedge from the tracker. Here, because the wedge is integrated and it is so huge as a wedge, it's very robust. You don't have like the wedge as a weak link. If anything, the wedge is the strong link in this uh, in this star tracker, which makes it really like uh, I, I have confidence in it. The main issue where I have less confidence is the adapter that I had to purchase together with a washer <laughs> in between the adapter and the tracker to 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 solve both issues that I mentioned, the one quarter of an inch uh, hole and the fact that the, the threads, the, the hole was not deep enough to accept the threads of my adapter. So I had to add a washer to that. So that actually adds a bit of wobbliness with the tripod connection that would be completely gone if I didn't have to use an adapter. So my guess is that once uh, Andres puts in practice my suggestions, uh, then this will be completely fixed. And I also already used the Star Tracker uh, yesterday and I did the polar alignment using Nina, actually, the three-point polar alignment using the manual mode of Nina. And the, the controls to adjust like both azimuth and altitude were actually really good, like very easy to, to use. And I didn't have any issues with that. So that's a really good thing as well. And uh, going back to the negatives a little bit, because this is print, 3D printed, uh, there were some parts that had a bit of gunk in them, like, you know, 3D printed plastic gunk and I needed to like thread a, a screw through a hole and that hole was like kind of filled with gunk and I had to remove the gunk first to assemble it. Uh, so yeah, it was interesting. Once it's on a tripod, you want to put a ball head on top. And then once you're done, you can just place your camera there and you're good to go. You just need to polar align the, tri the, the tracker. Obviously, polar alignment would be done by most people in Northern America using like the uh, uh, provided uh, laser pointer. For me, I used the Nina three-point polar alignment uh, plugin in manual mode, and that worked really well. And I used it together with this as my telescope. So that's just like a, an ASI 120mm, uh, so a, a small guide camera, together with the ZW uh, guide scope there. Very simple setup, still 120 millimeters uh, focal length. And I did a, a few like 120 seconds exposure with this uh, kit after polar alignment. And I didn't see uh, any like obvious oblong stars. So that was a success. Uh, but this is pretty light. Like this is like maybe 700 grams uh, tops. So we're very far from the three kilograms capacity of this star tracker, which means that I need to torture this star tracker. So. Uh, once those clouds clear, which should be at around like uh, 11 p.m. tonight, fingers crossed, I'll be using something different and I'll be torturing this poor little piece of kit there. Uh, I will be going completely overboard with specs. I think it's going to be a total of four kilograms on it instead of three. And the moment arm will not be fav favorable to the poor little thing either because I'm going to mount this. <laughs> This is obviously a Red Cat 51, and it is together with a Taupe Tech camera. The whole thing kind of weighs more than four kilograms. Uh, so yeah, uh, the only advantage though is that the uh, the dovetail that comes with the Red Cat has an, uh, an, an a side of it that can be used with the uh, the ball head adapters, so quick release plates effectively. So see, so this is how it looks. It looks completely ridiculous. And honestly, if I'm able to even take like 10 second long exposures like that, it's going to be a resounding success. So we'll see what happens there. Now, obviously, I need to lighten this as much as possible. So let's do that together. By default, I have this thing together with the guide scope we talked about. And I also have an ASI Air Mini here. Uh, I also have a ZWEF focus motor there. And this is all held together by 3D printed parts that are done by yet someone else. So Nick, one of my uh, Patreon supporters and subscribers actually designs, builds and sends and sells all of those parts. And there I've already featured them in the video. So all of those like uh, 3D printed cable management adapters there. They're super convenient, uh, but I'm just going to remove them for this video because even if there are a few grams, there are a few grams. And so goodbye adapters here. I'm also going to remove the uh, ASI Air Mini with the uh, 3D printed cable management adapters. Ah, there we go. I'm going to remove the guide scope. And then we're left with just the ZWEF, but the ZWEF, it's another 
like sizable source of weight for the whole setup. So we're going to remove that. Oh, and by the way, I did a review of this uh, focuser mount on the channel before. I'll put all of the links down in the description if you're interested in any of those 3D parts. But this is one of the best ways to get your Red Cat focused. And the guy who makes all of those uh, 3D printed adapters, he also has uh, changed the belt tensioner at the other side here to make it adjustable so you can change the length of it and therefore how much you tension the belt. Uh, so that was a really welcome change. He sent me that additional part so I could use it later. Uh, but I'm just going to remove all of that for now. And here we are. Now this is the setup we're going to use. It is definitely lighter than it used to be. I have removed the focuser uh, assembly. I've removed the ASI Air with its cable management, and I removed the guide scope that would all fit onto the uh, onto the focuser assembly. Now we have the lightest possible that this can be. I'll be doing the focus manually using the button of mask that is actually not the one that came with the Red Cat because the one that came with the Red Cat is actually fairly middling, not very good. This is another 3D printed part, which is made by uh, my friend and fellow YouTuber, uh, Luke from the Lucomatical channel. I'll also have a link to that down in the description. If you're interested, this is far superior to the native uh, button of mask that comes with the Red Cat. This is really a video about 3D printed stuff, isn't it? But now without all of those adapters, they this actually does not look as ridiculous as it was just a few minutes ago. I have a bit more faith in this, and this is actually surprisingly sturdy. I have a good feeling about this. If this works, this would be really good, really, really good. So we're going to see. <laughs> Now, before that, I also want to mention how this actually all works. How do you power this Star Tracker and how do you control it? So powering the Star Tracker is also one of the slightly janky stuff things about it because this white thing here is uh, a motor plug. So you need to actually plug in a motor cable. Boom, there we go. And this plugs into the control box for the Star Tracker. And there's a nice little uh, hook there to have like your control box like hanging from it. And as input, it will have a USB uh, C port here. So you can, the ideal thing would be a fairly dumb battery bank. Uh, don't try to have like a, one of those smart battery banks that will actually try to do the uh, USB C handshake protocol to figure out how much volts these things want. It, will not work. You just want like a dumb power supply, ideally, that will output in USB-A, so old full-size USB kind of stuff, rather than USB-C, because that can... I had issues with USB-C only uh, power banks. But when that's, uh, once you have your power bank and you just uh, plug it in, and this will turn it on. And as you can see, this is another annoyance that I have with this Star Tracker. It's a green LED. It might not show on the video right now, but that thing is incredibly br bright. And that annoys me, like uh, astrophotography stuff, astro stuff in general, should never, ever, ever use green LEDs. I even think like the green laser is not a good idea. It should be a red laser. Uh, I don't know. I, it's like, it's far too bright. Uh, it, it disturbs our night vision. It's a bad idea. Andre should do something about it and, and replace this LED. Um, I've actually been covering it with electric tape uh, just to like remove all of that crazy brightness. So that's one thing that I don't like with the control scheme of, of this. I also don't like something else, which is like, while it is powered on, do not disconnect the motor or replug it or reconnect it uh, because it can harm the motor, apparently. Eh. <laughs> So that's also a bit janky. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but there's some really good stuff about this. There's first a five volt out if you need five volts somewhere else. There's also an intervalometer plug here. So if you want to control your camera directly from the Star Tracker, it is possible just like it is with things like the Star Adventurer. And something that I really like because it, it uh, bodes well for the future is that there are two plugs here. One for the RA motor, for right ascension motor, this one, and one for the declination motor. Declination? Are you planning to make this into a fully fledged go-to mount? <laughs> that would be amazing. And I think it's actually in the plans by Andres. Can you imagine like uh, a super cheap 3D printed open source go-to mount 
that can carry, let's hope, for like three kilograms. Maybe I hope it would be around three, 300 euro would be nice. That would be amazing. It's just my wish list there. I have no idea if that's going to be done. Uh, but yeah, good stuff and bad stuff. That LED, seriously, that LED and the laser as well. Make it a red laser. Come on. But now there's another annoyance there to me is that if you want the star tracker to work, uh, now that you've plugged it in, as I understand it, it's actually not tracking. You need to first connect to it via your smartphone. So it builds its own Wi-Fi network. It doesn't need any internet or anything like that. It's just a local Wi-Fi network that the Star Tracker creates on its own. You connect to it from your phone and then you access a web page to control the Star Tracker. But I don't like being the field and depending 100% on Wi-Fi connectivity. Sometimes it, it can't be helped like something like the C-Star S50. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, or even the ASI Air. But a Star Tracker, I feel the moment I plug it in, by default, it should be tracking. I, would, I should not need to connect to it via my phone and then tell it to track at a sidereal rate. It should just be tracking automatically, so I don't need to connect it if I don't want to do anything special. But let's connect to it. Let me show you how it works. Okay, I'm now on my phone and I'm looking at the Wi-Fi networks that are available. So the uh, the Star Tracker actually generates its own Wi-Fi. You don't need the internet or anything like that. And I am connected to this OG Star Tracker Wi-Fi network. And then I need to go to a browser and go to tracker.com. I actually don't think this is good practice. Uh, I think uh, Andre should just provide an IP or the less general address to connect to because for some browsers, you will actually need to uh, use incognito mode. Uh, and now that I'm connected, I have access to a control center effectively where I can turn on the CDRL tracking, which again, I think it should be on by default the moment you provide power to it. But now I've tapped the on button and it is on. It is currently tracking. And if you have a DSLR and you'll be using it with a DSLR, which I assume is the, the standard scenario, you have the intervalometer control with exposure lengths and the number of exposures that you want to take. And you can just start the capture, walk away and let the Star Tracker do its job. So those are very standard features for Star Trackers, but it's nice to see them well implemented there. And there is something more here, which is you can also slew your uh, tracker in right, right ascension at various speeds. The maximum speed is there. And this area is where I am very disappointed that, you know, this is not an app. It should be an app rather than a website because I cannot just like keep my uh, finger on the button and let it slew. I need to actually repeatedly tap on the button like this. <laughs> for the Star Tracker to actually be slewing. It's a bit uh, annoying. I wish I could just like keep it on the uh, button the whole time and it would just keep slewing. That's a bit uh, <laughs> ridiculous, but it does work. So yeah, I can't complain too much either. And that's the gist of it concerning like the Star Tracker, the design, the assembly, uh, the polar alignment, which worked really well. Uh, the fact that it worked well with this, but obviously now we want to uh, test it out with the Red Cat 51, which really should bring it to the limit. It's actually far over the limit of the poor Star Tracker, but we're still going to test it. You also see some of the weak points are like, I would like to say more like growing pains of this Star Tracker. The good thing being Andre seems to be very reactive and can iterate very quickly because this is basically 3D printed. So if you need to make a change, it's very easy to do. And if you have a 3D printer, you can even do it on your own, which is super cool. I mean, how, how could you say that about your Star Adventure or your Ioptron Star Tracker? Not so much. But anyway, tonight, hopefully the, star, the skies will clear, will clear. So I will be able to test out this ridiculous setup and see how well it works. And I'll let you know once I'm done. Obviously, I'll put all of the links in the description to the Star Tracker or to any of the other 3D printed accessories that I mentioned, as well as to my assembly full and uncut and full of swear words <laughs> video down below. Again, swear words. So don't watch if you don't like that. There is also something else that I want to do with this Star Tracker. And it's doing this, using it as an equatorial wedge for the C-Star S50 because it is a, a fold shaped wedge and I trust it far more than something like the Star Adventurer uh, wedge. And 
I can have the C star and stop. On top, the C star now has a horizon calibration routine, which is basically a three star alignment. And so it can work even when it is not level. And therefore, I can use it in equatorial mode, which would be great to avoid things like field rotation. So I hope to be using the star tracker, maybe off just as a passive wedge for the C-Star S50 to see how the C-Star S50 works in equatorial mode. It's not going to be for this video. So if you want to watch when I actually do that, don't forget to go down below, subscribe, uh, click that bell button. And while you're at it, you can like the video, leave a comment because that truly, truly helps the channel and helps this channel get noticed. And if you want to support me even more, you can go down below, join my Patreon link in the description or join the channel as a member. It truly helps out. I've seen a lot of people also do like uh, thank you comments, which also help a tremendous amount. Anyway, now that I'm done with this little teaser here, uh, let's get back to the Star Tracker. I will test it out with the Red Cats and let's skip to the results. And the results are in. So it actually took me quite a while to get the results and it delayed the video quite a bit because we had really cloudy nights for quite a while. And yesterday evening, even though the forecast was for a cloudy night, we had like one hour of clear skies before uh, clouds and rain. <laughs> So I took advantage of that. I quickly got the Star Tracker out, put the red cat on top, uh, polar aligned using the Nina uh, polar alignment routine from the three point polar alignment plugin. And then I pointed the red cat while trying to be very careful to not bump the tripod to some random spot in the sky, not far from uh, the Orion Nebula. But I didn't try to like, you know, center any specific target because I just didn't have the time until the clouds rolled in and with the red cat uh, I took a series of 30 seconds and 60 seconds exposures to see whether I could get decent results and to be honest I wasn't expecting much because really the red cat combined with the dovetail plate and the camera was a very long and heavy item for the tripod, for the adapter from uh, 3 eighths of an inch to 1 fourth of an inch, and also for the ball head that I, that I was using. And uh, I was surprised when I was doing the manipulations that it, the actual tracker itself did not seem to be the bottleneck or the limiting factor. Really the biggest problem was the uh, tripod. I would have wanted like a more full size tripod than the, the one that is used for the C star. And I think that makes sense. And it was also the, uh, the adapter between the tripod and the, the tracker that I think really adds a bit of wobbliness. So really while my expectations were real, did not expect much and took a bunch of 30 second and 60 second exposures. And here are the results. So I have here my uh, 30 second exposures and I took quite a few and uh, we have some good samples and bad samples in here. Uh, so yeah, random star field, right? I didn't, uh, I didn't try to go to any specific targets simply because I didn't have the time. But if you look at the star field itself, I mean, it looks, looks fine. And then you zoom in, you zoom in, Okay, we start to see a little bit of elongation. You zoom in, a bit more elongation is visible. You zoom in and yeah, okay, elongation is quite visible at this stage. And if I go one to one, which is actually how we are right now, we can see indeed there is some elongation on the stars there. So that was one of my exposures. Let's go for another one of those 30 second exposures. And now as I go in, I don't see the elongation that much uh, and yeah, even like right now, the stars look quite round. If I go to this level of zoom, which I believe is one to one, you can see we have a little tiny bit of uh, elongation for the stars, but not that much. And honestly, when I'm looking at that, this is far better than I expected for the equipment that I paired the tracker with. And I think, I really think that once uh, Andrej amends the uh, tracker to use three quarter, uh, three eighth of an inch, uh, screws, it will remove a lot of the potential weak points uh, that I could have. But I feel like a, a big limiting factor was also the, uh, the the ball head that is holding the telescope. It's just, it's very unwieldy. And I, I felt like I was pushing the whole system far too much. But still, we're getting a decent result here in one of the exposures. Let's look at the other still. So that's another 30 second exposure. So let's zoom in a bit, zoom in a bit. 
zoom in a bit. Okay, we start to see a little bit of elongation, but again, it's not that bad. I think I'm above one to one. Here is the one to one ratio, like kind of uh, zoom, and we do see elongation there. So another example. Uh, we had, by the way, a little bit of wind as well during that session. Um, and so that could have played a role. <laughs> so it's really not a very scientific test, but it is definitely a real world test in the worst possible circumstances uh, with, with the, uh, uh, the Red Cat 51. Okay, let's look at this one, 30 seconds, yet another one that uh, I took. Zoom in, zoom in. I think I start to see some elongation. Zoom in, still a bit elongation. Zoom in again, we're now one to one. And it's actually not that bad at all. Less elongation than in the previous frame. And a final sample here. Let's zoom in, zoom in. I can see some elongation in this in a different direction than before. So I think this uh, likely is due to wind more than it is to tracking. Uh, but you can see we are now at one to one and you can see there is a, a, an oblongness in the uh, kind of up, down or north, south uh, direction compared to it's like almost 90 degrees off from before. So I suspect wind more than anything else. But honestly, those results for a 250 millimeters way, uh, focal length with a fairly heavy scope and camera setup placed far away from the RA axis because of the ball head and with a large moment arm there, it's I'm impressed. I, I did not think we would get such decent results and I don't think we could get such results with uh, a Star Adventure. Now that we've seen the 30 seconds, let's look at 60 seconds. What do we get with 60 seconds? Honestly, the results are a bit less good, but let's have a, let's have a look anyway. So this is first sample, 60 seconds, zoomed out, looks kind of fine. Start to zoom in, I start to see some oblongness already. And then zoom in more, more oblongness, Zoom in more, okay, yeah, there's a lot of oblongness there. So yeah, 60 seconds might be a bit too much if you are a, a pixel peeper with that particular setup. Again, this is the torture test for that port tracker and tripod uh, set. Let's have a look at another 60 seconds exposure. So zoomed out, it looks fine. Let's zoom in, zoom in. I start to see maybe a little bit of oblongness. Zoom in some more. Yeah, I can see the oblongness and now we are at one to one, but this is actually a fairly decent one. Uh, the effect of the oblongness is almost double star. So I'm wondering whether this is caused by a tracking jump or by wind. So that's where, you know, it's a real world test. It's very difficult to uh, isolate the individual contributors to the issue, but this is the actual result that I'm getting. Let's look at another one. Full field, let's zoom in a bit. Zoom in some more. I start to see some oblongness, like the, the story repeats itself. We're zooming in some more, but it's not that bad. And now we are at a one to one and we can see the oblongness, basically the same as before. All of those 60 seconds exposures, they look like one another. Let's do the same with the last one. So zoom in, zoom in. We start to see the oblongness. Zoom in, it's more obvious. And this is actually the worst uh, result of the bunch that I took of 60 second exposures. And so that's basically the result for this, uh, this star tracker. And I wish I had like an actual camera with a lens to, to use it on um, that had a decent focal length, right? But I don't, uh, so I can't do that test, but I did the torture test and I think this tracker performed really well in the torture test, especially with the adapters that I had to use. And I think it will be an even better tracker with the enhancements that I've suggested across the video. And I will give uh, early access to Andres to this video a few days, maybe five days or so, so he can have some time to <laughs> do changes to the, uh, to the design. So definitely have a, a look down in the description while you're going there. You know, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment on the video. Let us know what you think of this tracker. Super curious to think, to, to see your thoughts on it because it's a $200 tracker, even maybe a bit less even. It's like, I think that's a really, really good price for something that has this amount of performance. And also while you're there, remember that if you want to support me at no cost to yourself, you can click on any of the affiliate links that I have in the description. Like you want to buy anything from Amazon at all, just click on the Amazon link and buy whatever you want. Or you want to buy anything from Agena, you know, go for it. Just click the link, 
and you can get it. Or there's also astroshop.eu that I started uh, supporting recently. Any bit helps and this is at no cost to you. But obviously, just watching the videos, liking, subscribing helps a lot. If you want to help even more, you're, sp you're feeling splendid and generous today, you can join my Patreon, link down in the description, or join my channel as a member. Talking about my Patreons and channel members, you guys make the channel possible completely. Uh, this video was more than 20 minutes long, so I will add the credits with my Patreon supporters and channel members as they are responsible for making this possible. And I hope you'll have a look at this uh, this Star Tracker. I have the utmost respect for someone who can just go ahead and say like, hey, the Star Tracker is on the market. They're too expensive and not good enough. I'm gonna make my own <laughs> and I'm gonna make it open source so everyone can make a copy, but I'll still sell it because if you want to have it pre-assembled or just like pre-3D printed with all of the parts that you need? Why not? I think that's awesome. And I, rem I am really thankful for people like Andrej who make the hobby advance in ways that sometimes the big commercial players cannot um, manage to do or afford to do. So I love that. And thank you, Andrej, for all your work on this tracker and for making it available as an option. And I hope that a lot of you go and check out his work and uh, because it's really worth it and I, I really hope you do. But with that, that's all I had for uh, today. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. But more important than all of that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.